You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Before the fight, I'm like, I want to see blood. I want, I want to. <laughs> I, I can remember punching Jimmy in the second round, mm. and his face just burst open. My hands was felt like they dipped in oil. It was just blood everywhere, and it was like so greasy. And it was uh, when you see that blood, it just it just spurs you on more, and it, it kind of got me more aggressive. I've always been allergic to treatments all the time, and I never got on with any treatments. I was sat on like a chemo drip for twice. I was on it, and I was just having bad reactions to it. Basically, that's what it was, like treatments, biological treatments. Nothing was working, really. And then, luckily, I went in for remission for about a year, and that was the prize fighting tournament year, 2019. The whole of that year, I was in my remission where it was under control, basically. Um, I moved to a different hospital, um, and then, yeah, I was in remission for about a year, and everything was under control. And then, obviously, the last year, last lockdown is when it just went bad again, so... Yeah, it's, it's been a mad mad journey. I, all my fight career, I've fought with colitis. Just dealt with it, really. They say surgery is last resort, and I was avoiding it for years. Mm -hmm. But they did say it five years ago that um, there was like, you know, if a couple of these more treatments don't work, you're going to have to have surgery. And I was just like, no, I'm not having that. 100% in my head, I was like, I'm not having surgery. I think because I had avoided it for that many years, it just, got, just kept getting worse. Was it the bag it put you off? Yeah, it was the bag, and... Obviously, my fighting career, I thought that was going to be it, it was over. And then I got rushed in it in the middle of the night and uh, the, the basically, it was like three in the morning, drugged up and all these surgeons rushing in, waking me up like, you know, you need surgery now. I'm like, this is like, a, it was like off a movie. It was scary, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, my missus, she, she thought I was going to die. Like, she actually told her mum, she's like, I think he's going to die. Like, what? She, that's, she, that's how bad. And then a week later, I got rushed in again. I had to have emergency surgery because um, there was a stitch internally too tight, a little bit too tight, and it was causing, causing some severe blockages. So I was getting blocked up. Nothing was coming out. And um, this, I was getting severely sick. And uh, they basically said, if it's not going to come out that way, it's going to come out this way. And I was going to be sick. Like, And there was going to be crap. Shut up, yeah. Boom, we're on today's <laughs> guest. We've got Bare Knuckle World Champion, Rico Franco. Nice How to meet you, you mate. Yeah, it's good to be on, mate. Really good. Good to have you on. Definitely. Watched a couple of your fights. Yeah. <laughs> Next level stuff, that Bare Knuckle stuff. <laughs> but you're 6-0? Oh? Yeah, 6-0 and oh by BKB, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um, it is a scary sport, though, when you see people just absolutely tearing it up. For you, your story is you've, you've won world title, but just a few months after it, you had a life-threatening disease which yeah. basically killed you yeah um which is mad to think that you're in a ring fighting basically for your life and then outside that you're also fighting for your life which we'll touch on first of all how are you i'm doing really well mate best i've ever felt in pff, all my life i think <laughs> definitely you're looking great yeah thank you good mate i always go back to the start for my guests where you grew up and how it all began yeah so I've, i grew up in uh, hometown gainsborough um just a normal kid i was always active I used to like have a bit of a temper. I like to fight all the time at school, and I was always active playing. I was swimming when I was young, and I was playing a lot of football as well. But I didn't start my f boxing training until end of the years at school, probably maybe 15, 16. Started doing a bit of boxing, and then um, yeah, I just I got into boxing. Then phew, it was just travelling a long time. Like although I didn't have a car or anything, so. I fell into MMA. There was an MMA gym in my hometown, and uh, that was it. I just fell in love with MMA. I just like training every day, and that's how I really got into it. Like about yeah. 13 years ago. Did you have a big family? Not really. No, I've never had. Me, my dad's from Portugal, so basically I'm half Portuguese, so half the family's that side, and uh, we haven't really got. I don't have anything to do with my family this side really. It's just me and my brother. My mum passed away. So six and a half years ago now so sorry to hear that yeah it's just mainly me and my brother and uh yeah my dad's still in Gainsbury just out and about all the time going back to Portugal and stuff so um yeah it's just uh I like I like to keep, I like to keep it small anyway 
best uh, way. Yeah, there's not, not too much drama then. Yeah, exactly. Less drama, yeah. less hassle. What were you like at school, Rico? Um, thick. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. <laughs> that's why I uh, fight bare knuckle now. Mm. Um, no, yeah, I was. I was always polite and respectful, but um, you know, I was just always mischievous, always getting into trouble, fighting and getting ex like excluded and stuff like that. But I was never really. I wasn't a horrible kid. I was always just like, always a bit like, just I had to do something, just like a bit mad. I was always like just adventurous, active, playing football, sports, and just had a bit of a temper on me. I don't know whether that's from my dad's Portuguese side, but yeah, it's, uh, I was always getting into trouble, to be fair, and I didn't really get great grades. To be fair, I wanted to, I was going to go in the army at first. That's what I wanted to do, and I couldn't get in because uh, I had bad bad eczema at the time, bad skin, and I was on steroid creams, and they wouldn't let you in because of that, so like everything happens for a reason, that's why I didn't yeah. go in. I'm glad I didn't know. Was it, did you have a close relationship with your dad in your younger years? Um, yeah, yeah, in younger years, it was, uh, we had a steady relationship, obviously, uh, I was really, me, me, my brother was really close to my brother, like, proper close, uh, and uh, yeah, we just stuck by each other, throughout everything really just overcome everything so but yeah it's been pretty mad <laughs> uh, so you've done boxing MMA bare knuckle so when you started boxing what age did you go down to the MMA route uh, probably about 16 I think I had my first fight about 10 years ago when I first turned 18 so yeah about 10 years ago um, that was at Liverpool I, I was training for a good two years before two or three years I wanted to get a bit of experience first but I can't, that was kind of a last minute fight. I jumped on it in a week's notice and I was, I was pretty ready, but I didn't really know what to expect. And I was like crapping it. I, Are you scared? I, yeah, I was nervous. Honestly, I'll never forget that first fight because um, I was against some like jujitsu gold medalist and I was just nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I just didn't know how to control them nerves. But um, I had a UFC, uh, UFC coach in his corner and I was just crapping it. But then I got through three rounds and he beat me on decision. But I was just, I was so fuming. I, I, I'd hate losing. But it was it was an amazing experience. I lost my first two amateur fights actually, and obviously that that could break a lot of people. And you know they, they'll probably just give up. But it kind of like motivated me more to get that win. And that and that third fight when I won it was the best feeling ever. It was amazing. And obviously. I hate losing, I'm competitive, so it just, yeah, made it made it better, to be fair. How's the training then? Um, it Back was, it was yeah, it was hard, because um, I was, I wasn't like, I wasn't struggling with training, I was training every day, but I was obviously, I was still at school, and when I left school, I was just trying to get jobs, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, I didn't really have a, a plan in place, I was just going with the flow, I had a few, uh, I was working part-time at Morrison's, I was at college, and I was doing bits and bobs, hustling on side. What were you doing at college? I was doing bricklaying. <laughs> so I'm a bricky by trade. Uh, I did I did about uh, two years, three years at college, and then uh, I just kind of went out of it. I didn't really go, for, I didn't do out from it. It was just, just got a bit of a trade just to see what happened, and I didn't really... Uh, I didn't really get out from it now, so I've probably forgot how to do it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when did you realise, okay, I'm going to stick with MMA? What age were you? Yeah, after a few fights, after after I got that first win, I thought, I'm going to stick with this. I'm, I'm just going to like see how far I can go. And it, it, at first it started, it was just a bit of a hobby, but then I kind of got obsessed with it. And I was just, every day, every day I was just waking up thinking, right, I'm off training later. I, I was obviously working through the day then, I had a full-time job for so many years. And then uh, I've changed jobs like three times, but I was always just like focused on fighting. That's And then it just clicked one day, I just wanted to do fighting. And it was that was it really. Even though I was training full, uh, working full-time, I was training every day, but I was just like, I want to train full-time. Like that is my dream to like train full-time, not have to work and like somehow get an income. So like going, Going through that, you'll have to like kind of hustle on the side, mm -hmm. get a few jobs and you know bits and bobs, get a bit of income, and like try and blank some sponsors. So sponsorships are massive uh, for MMA fighters because there's no money in it. There's yeah. no money in even pro MMA. There's not much money. 
But then when I had my first pro fight, um, I basically, I had to think, right, I need to try and train full time. So I, I, fucked, I fucked the job off and I went part time and then I slowly did it that way. So it, it's been hard, like there's no money in it. Uh, so what do you do for just the love of fighting? What enjoyment do you get out of fighting, Rico? I, do you I enjoy getting hit in that? Yeah, I think it's the I think it's just the training, like the buzz you get from just training, like even grappling, like you get a, just that feeling when you finish the trailing, you've let off all them endorphins and you just feel amazing. And obviously while I'm sparring, I don't know what it is like getting punched, but you just get a you get a good buzz when you <laughs> <laughs> people might think you're mad, but uh -huh. every fighter knows what I mean and like when you get that little trade when you're trading punches, getting the you just feel amazing. Like you just come out of the gym, you just feel like everything that's going on in the world, you just forget when you're training mm. and you're just in that zone and you just feel amazing. You feel free. Just amazing. Do you ever get used to it though? Do you ever get nervous now? Or was there in, do those nerves go the more you do it? Yeah, the, the, the more you do it, the more experience you get, the less nerves. So like my last fight, I, there was no nerves at all. It was just more excitement. And uh, I've never enjoyed a fight so much than the last one because... All these years' experience just adding up, and I know how to deal with them, them emotions now because you get mixed emotions in a fight. But yeah, at, at first, obviously, it's scary because you don't know what you're going in for, and it's there's so many nerves and emotions going on. You just you know it's hard to deal with it. Mm -hmm. When did the BK B come around? Um, probably about three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I was fighting. I've had about ten pro MMA fights. And uh, my coach Danny, he was ex UFC fighter Danny Mitchell, and he's he's had a few illegal bare knuckle when he was a kid, and he was telling me some stories, and I thought, listen, I I, I said to him, I want to fight bare knuckle just to try it, like even if it's illegal on the street or just get me a fight one day, and I uh, I want to see just just to feel what it's like, you know, without gloves, and then uh, BKB actually uh, contacted Danny because they wanted him to fight on an ex UFC fighter but he had a few uh, brain injuries. He got knocked off a bike and he had a bit of concussion, but um, he put my name forward. He's like, I know a guy that wants to do it. Um, so what do you reckon? It was like, yeah, bring him down. We'll come watch a show at the London O2 and uh, we'll, we'll get you on the next show and see how it is. And uh, yeah, I went down to the O2 and watching it live and that was it. I watched it live and I was like, I need to get in this. I, I'm booking in for a fight. So that was it on the next show, Liverpool Eco Arena. I was there on the next show, and it was pretty crazy. That was it. I just I had that first fight, and uh, just to see what it's like, and I, I just fell in love with it after that first one. What's the hardest to go? For? What's the hardest fights of boxing? You've obviously got thicker gloves, MMA, and then bare knuckle. What's the hardest fight in those three categories for you? The hardest one I'd say is glove boxing. Why is that? it's hard to explain but it feels because obviously bare knuckle you've got no gloves so you feel free it's more like realistic to a street fight but same with MMA it's like there's all different disciplines uh, in combat so if you're struggling stood up you can just take them down on the ground or if you're, if you're struggling on the ground you can try and get back up again but MMA is so hard obviously like you're getting controlled by a grappler and it's you just feel suffocated but when it's like boxing, it's just straight boxing with gloves. Again, you feel suffocated because if you're against a good guy just tagging you and you're, you're cornered in, a, in the corner just getting tagged, there's nowhere to hide. You can't run anywhere. And it's, I don't know, I just feel you, you can't really get through with them boxing gloves and like, mm -hmm. like bare knuckle. But I think, yeah, boxing is hard. I've, I've sparred with some good pro boxers and it is tough, very tough. Yeah. What? How hard is it to go from boxing MMA to bare knuckle? Did you think doing all the rest of those things enhanced you for bare knuckle? Or is it just totally different art technique? Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid of both of them. It's kind of like both in one. It's, it's obviously it's boxing, boxing rules without gloves. But then it's like it feels like your MMA fight because four ounce pro gloves is pretty much like Nothing. without. Yeah, it mm -hmm. feels the same. So that's why I think it won a bit. It won a big shot when I went to bare knuckle because I'm used to that um, range with mm -hmm. small gloves on. So it wasn't really a massive shock. It was quite. It felt comfortable because I was used to bare, um, MMA most of my life. Yeah. So it, it just felt like yeah, I was just fighting MMA. So you're a better. Do you think you're a better bare knuckle fighter than MMA fighter? 
I'd say so, yeah, definitely. Um, I was always a, a good striker in MMA. Like Every loss was a submission. So I did work. I have got three twi twister submissions at uh, Pro MMA, which is pretty mad. I think that's like no one's ever got three. But you're only allowed to do that in pro because it's like a, yeah, twisting the spine so it's illegal in amateur. But yeah, it's, um, I just find boxing at bare knuckle is my kind of thing. I, after that first fight, I thought I found my sport. I found something that's my style. Do you know what I mean? For fighting. So yeah, I just feel so comfortable in there. Mm -hmm. With the bare knuckle fighting, how hard is it to stick to tactics? Because when it's so brutal yeah. and you're getting fucking... Yeah, knockout punches but survive them does the tactics go right out the window or do you, do you begin with a plan because when you watch the bare knuckle fights the ones I've seen it just looks like a free for all just both fighters swinging yeah. is there tactics involved compared to MMA and boxing yeah yeah, definitely you've got to have a you've got to have a good solid game plan because if you don't then you've got to kind of be smart where I like to use my range in and out try and take less damage as possible because if you're going in like a pro boxer, like gloves high, trying to swing, you're just going to punch elbows. You know, like if you're going to punch in the wrong places, that's it, you've broke your hand straight away. So you've got to like pick your shots and be smart. That's what I've tried to do. The first fight I had, I went in mad and I was just, I think I broke my left knuckle. But that's the only time I've had a hand injury out of six fights. And I've kind of just adapted. As every fight went on, I've, I've kind of learned right, I need to do this, I need to do that. And I've adapted. And uh, that last fight, I finally found, you know, the perfect style against... Because Jimmy Sweeney, he's got... He's, he was the best in the sport. And, he, you know, just all of his wins, 25 wins, I think, one loss, you know, he's got the perfect style for it. So I was kind of like watching how he does it and then kind of replica in it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a mad style. What sort of injuries have you had from... What sport have you had the most injuries? Boxing, MMA or bare knuckle? MMA, yeah. 100% MMA. See, people would think probably bare, bare knuckle. knuckle. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, MMA, I've had um, I've had both knees popped out twice. Um, I've had... When I was sparring, I had two hematomas in the nose, two blood clots. I nearly died from that, actually. I nearly got a brain infection from that because, you know, the blood nearly travelled to the brain, but um, I had to have surgery on my nose. Um, I've had, yeah, my thumb broke, MMA gloves. I, yeah, I've had a few bad injuries. Obviously, you get cauliflower here. But, um, yeah, bare knuckle, I've not had... I've only had a few... I've had a few cuts, but nothing crazy. I, I had one little injury on my left knuckle in the first fight, but other than that, uh, no injuries at all. I actually had my last MMA fight um, was in December 2018. And yeah, and uh, obviously I had a prize fight, a tournament, uh, 2019 in January. So it was a month apart and I thought, right, I'll get this MMA fight, trying to get no injuries. But I actually broke my hand in the MMA fight. I got really bad ligament damage. And obviously I'd, I was entered this prize fight, a tournament, and the winner get to fight Jimmy Sweeney. And um, I broke my hand and I said to Danny, like, you know, this is... This is this is my tournament. I said this is made for me. It was a sign that I'm going to fight Jimmy because I've wanted to fight Jimmy as soon as I entered the sport. And obviously, I broke my hand, so I, was, I had to go to the uh, specialist and get some injections. I had an MRI scan. He said, "Yeah, it's knackered. It's going to take about six months." So I basically had the whole prize fight a tournament with one hand. I couldn't even spar or use my right hand for the whole tournament, which was pretty mad. Not many people knew that either. Only like people I train with and stuff, so that was pretty a uh, mad one as well. <laughs> so, but you get when you've done a prize fighter, how many fights? Three, four. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, you it knocked was a, a couple out. Your first couple of yeah. guys, you put you knocked out straight away first round. Yeah, the so the quarter final straight. It was an eight man tournament, quarter final, semi final, and the final. Mm -hmm. So the first two went to plan, and lucky I just got them <clears throat> cleaned out straight away. And then the final was a tough seven rounder. He was a tough bastard, him. He was. Who is that guy? James Connolly from Birmingham. He, yeah, he yeah. was. He looked massive as well, man. He, he was. That yeah. was a was that a full seven rounds? It was a full seven rounds. Yeah, and I had bad concussion after that fight. I tell you, because we had a bit of a game plan, but because it was the uh, three fight cams back to back, no rest, and I, after the I knocked the guy out in the semi final, and because I knocked him out so quick, 
in about 40 seconds. I had about two days off and I went back to the gym and I kind of peaked too early in the camp because I didn't have no rest and I thought, oh, I'm just going to get straight back on it. And I kind of overtrained a little bit. So it did wear you out three camps straight in a row. But um, obviously it was a big build up for the final, a load of pressure. And it was just, it was a, and in the end, we just both got in there and just swung down. The game plans went out the window and it was just, it was just a bit of a slugfest really. There was just yeah. no, not much technique. It was just swinging. And what did you win for that 10 grand? It was 10,000, yeah. 10, it doesn't 000. seem fuck all to yeah. what you really go through. And no, the yeah. Blood on the face, blood everywhere, <laughs> kind of concussions, nearly dying, brain injuries. Yeah. You think people love combat sports. Why don't? Why do you not think people aren't taking it to bare knuckle fighting as fast? Or do you think it is becoming popular? Yeah, it's definitely coming more popular now. Because um, I don't really know of it Pff, about five years ago. I didn't really hear of any shows, you know what I mean? So, But now it's coming so popular there's quite a few uh lower shows and that going on but mine's the biggest show in like europe or whatever you know it's massive and uh it's it's slowly getting bigger and bigger like a big platform now but it's more for them people that have you know have had a good had a fight career and they want to maybe finish off with a bit of bare knuckle because you wouldn't suggest to someone do bare knuckle straight away in their first fight career because something you need a bit of experience for you know, unless you've had, like, Kimbo Slice had loads of street fights. But, yeah, it's something, I don't know, it's a strange one, really. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's, it's. I kind of went in it halfway through my career, but I feel like I'm in my prime now. So, yeah, we'll see. What <laughs> age do people usually fight bare knuckle toe in their late 30s, 40s? Yeah, I'd say, I'd mm -hmm. say, like, late 20s, early 30s, early 40s, yeah. What age are you now, 30? I'm 28. Fuck's sake, so I'm man. Still, <laughs> still young, mate. Still young. Still, still got young. Yeah. You still hit your prime in your 30s and your 40s. You yeah. get bigger, stronger, fat. I don't know if they... I think the last thing to go is power. So see when you fought, is it Connolly and yeah. the Eliminator? Did you... The punches that you were giving him would have knocked out anybody else? Yeah, I think... Yeah. It was It was a strange fight. It was an awkward fighter. I'd prefer to fight a proper boxer in bare knuckle than fight like someone like James because mm. it was it had an awkward style. Kept bending down a lot, which was frustrating. I couldn't really get me shots going, but I think he kind of knew I was going for that same left up knockout what I did in the semi final. But yeah, it was very tough, tough fight. And uh, like I say, when the game plan goes out the window, you're both swinging. It's it's anyone's fight really. But he just yeah. took every shot on the chin and he would just won't go down. Tough it's crazy. Bastard, isn't yeah. it? I can remember one shot in the fourth round or fifth he gave me and it I got a quick buzz in my head, it like flashed white. I was like, shit, that hit hard. And I had to like reset and go again. But luckily I was fit and my recovery was good. Yeah. So when you're doing the what's the rules, first of all, for people who don't know? Bear knuckle, it's seven rounders, two minute rounds. Yeah. What else? What's the other rules? So it starts starts off my first fight was three twos, nice and easy, but it's like a fast pace. Obviously, a minute rest in between. Everything's the same rules as boxing, except you get a 20-second count if you get knocked down, um, and it's two-minute rounds. So that's the only difference, really. It's pretty much the same as boxing. Do you feel that a big help, the extra 10 seconds, yeah, if you get knocked yeah. down? Yeah, because 10 seconds is obviously, it just goes quick like that, but 20 seconds, you get a bit of an extra breather, which mm -hmm. is uh, it's good just to reset. So... Definitely helps. And it's just wraps around the knuckles. Does everybody have to wear those bandages? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. The, the the first few shows, it was around the knuckles, but now it's it just comes up halfway up your hand, so the knuckles are showing now. Mm -hmm. So it's just around the wrist. Cause Why obviously, is that? Because um, obviously when you're punching, if your wrist starts to bend a little bit, it's just a bit of support keeping it straight, Can otherwise you break you're going to break, yeah, break your wrist easy. Is it better with something around your knuckles or a clean I've, I've, heard, heard, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard somebody saying that when there's nothing on the knuckles, you can, um, it, damn it, it's not as, as yeah. sore on. Yeah, it's not as sore. Obviously, you get a bit of padding on there, but I prefer it without, just like it without any padding on the knuckles. It's, Why is that? I don't know. It just feels just feels like you're just free. <laughs> because I've spoke to many. Like I've had um, Richie Horsley on, who was a street fighter back in the day, great guy. I've had James Quinn on, the Gypsy King, yeah. who was undefeated in yeah. their own styles. I, I, who was it? But I can't remember who it was. I had this, but it's. I've said it before, but it says it's like about a self harming as well. Give me the pain. They like the pain. Getting yeah. punched when they they get excited. That is kind of fucked up. Do it you is. get that? Where you feel? Yeah. You want to feel the pain. I kind of like 
before the fight, I'm like, I want to see blood. I want, I want to. <laughs> like, I can remember punching Jimmy in the second round, mm. and his face just burst open. My hands was felt like they dipped in oil. It was just blood everywhere, and it was like so greasy. And it was uh, when you see that blood, it just it just spurs you on more, and it kind of got me more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, this is great. What so, did she have Messi say at all? Um, yeah, she does she come to your fights? Yeah, she comes to the fight. Oh yeah, she's really good support. She supports me all the way. Um, so massive fair uh, play, but she prefers watching me doing bare knuckle than MMA because she don't know what's going on on the ground. Do you know when it's on the ground and you know all my losses have been submissions in MMA, in, in MMA, but she don't really know what's going on on the ground grappling. So she gets a bit confused, like oh, what's going on here? But when it's boxing, she knows what's happening. Mm -hmm. But then she just when when she sees a bit of blood or if I get knocked down, you know she'll. She'll be panicking a bit, but she just yeah. gets pissed. <laughs> How was that? Um, when you got the Jimmy Sweeney fight, who's you say is the face of bare knuckle boxing? Yeah. yeah, I think he's only lost one or two fights. Three weight world champion. You were the underdog. Yeah, young kid coming into a fight. You won the eliminator. Yeah. Ve not well, not really well known then. Yeah. How much pressure was on you for that world title fight? To be honest, I, I didn't feel any pressure. It was, it was mad. I felt more pressure for the prize fighter final than I did for the Jimmy fight because obviously I was just an up and comer challenging Jimmy for his belt. I felt he had all the pressure on him and I was just happy to fight the guy. Like it was just an honor to fight Jimmy in the ring and share the ring with him because I've always looked up to him. And you know, since I started the sport, it was like Jimmy Sweeney, this he was the king of the sport, and you know, just. Before the, I shouldn't have done it, but before the prize fight, when I was in the tournament, I kind of looked past everyone and I was just visualizing Jimmy every day. Like, I'm going to win everyone, just going to beat everyone. And then every day I was just training for Jimmy. It was weird. And when it happened, it was like everything happened for a reason. And um, when I got through it, every day when I was visualizing it, everything come true in the fight and it was crazy. But it was, yeah, it was an honor to fight Jimmy and to share the ring with him. It was great. Are you a fan of the secret, the law of attraction? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Visualization, manifestation. Yeah, visualization. It's like what McGregor says, you know, mm -hmm. visualizing it every day. The more you do it, the more it's going to come true. And like I say, when I, when I was in the second round in that Jimmy fight, everything I visualized was happening. And it was like, I was kind of getting too confident. I was like, no, this is easy. This is like sparring. I started pulling some shapes, pissing about, messing about a little bit. Because in the fight camp was... There's a thing called defense lab, and you know, was was doing a bit of training, taking the taking the mick out of some shapes they was doing, and I started doing that in the third round, and that's when he knocked me down, basically. But yeah, look, messing about, you can't mess about in that game because one second you switch off, that's mm -hmm. it, you can just get knocked out. Was that your first knockdown? Yeah, first knockdown. But you looked ever. shaking. Was that not? You knocked knock down twice that round. Yeah, yeah, knocked me down twice. I think he just wanted to get get it over and done with because. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, I think the you know, the, I shocked him a little bit with uh, the speed and the pressure. It got a lot too, and obviously I, I cut his uh, jaw down here as well. And the second round was amazing. It went, it went, it couldn't have gone any better. But then, you know, when he knocked me down in the third twice, my recovery was good and it, I kind of I got up straight away. But then Danny said, you know, just get down, take the count, have a breather and then reset, go again. And then you could see Jimmy just trying to get it, get it finished mm -hmm. straight away. So, um yeah, that was a. It was a bit of a shocker. It it was kind of just a quick flash, and I kind of got got back up, and I, I knew what was going on. Uh, my legs weren't really that wobbly. I felt all right, to be fair, even though it looked like I was a little bit. I, but I did feel all right. It just everything just went too mm. quick. Is there much? Usually in the boxing, when they're tired, they get a rest, they'll grab on. Can you do that also in bare knuckle? Because the ref looks as if he splits it fast. Yeah, yeah, he splits it fast because obviously it's. It's a quick two minute round. As soon as that was a clinch, that's it. The the break it straight away. So, yeah, that's it. That it's a uh, Baz the ref. I think you uh, you've seen him before, Big Baz. Barrington. Yeah, Barrington. He's the yeah. ref. He's the ref. Uh, he was the ref for the. He's last a great fight. guy. Shout he out is, to Big yeah. Baz, man. Him and his missus Tracy, two great people. I'm always giving them shouts <laughs> out in this podcast. But phenomenal. Was that who the ref was? Yeah, yeah. So I never I, even I noticed. Yeah, yeah. He was the ref. Yeah. Big uh, Big Baz. So yeah, he was splitting it up and. Um, yeah, so that you was didn't want to fucking crazy. go against Big Baz, man. He is can, massive, man. I can remember one. Some lads are fighting once, and uh, they kept they kept grabbing hold of each other. And 
one of the lads tried to punch him while his hand was on the ground. So Baz grabbed him, like suplexed him like mm. over the ring, mate. It was mad. Yeah. <laughs> he has a, yeah, he's a machine. He is, yeah. And he fought for years with one eye. I know, yeah, he did, yeah. It's crazy. Nuts. So when you were going through that fight then, how hard was your camp? Did you train harder for that? Because I seen you were doing a lot of stuff with the breathing. We went in, what was that? The altitude? Yeah, so I went to the altitude chamber for that camp. Um, I did a little bit for the final as well, but it was mainly for the Jimmy yeah. fight. I was just trying a new few things. Went to the altitude chamber just to try and, uh, you know, get a bit of, get more, see if it got me a bit more fitter. But I could finally spar properly for that. My hand kind of healed, mm. even though it went 100%. Um, yeah, I could I could train. I had a full 10 week camp for that fight. So luckily, no injuries either. Like, first fight, mm. I had no injuries for. So everything went amazing, to be fair. Yeah, the altitude. So the, when you're in the altitude chamber, it's half the the air, yeah. So it's shorter recovery, yeah. But it's hard. The, the recovery is longer, <coughs> yeah. And it feels as if you're doing like a, two times the session that you're doing. Oh, so when crazy. you're going to bigger fights or fights, then yeah. your endurance is through the roof. Yeah, it's good to sleep in them chambers as well. We was trying to get in there to sleep, but um, yeah, we couldn't in the end. We just had we had an hour once a week just to see how it went, and you could feel it like halfway through the session. I think we was going a bit too hard in the training. Mm. You was only meant to go light and I think we was doing like full on sessions in there for an hour, yeah. nearly passing out. After. Because you are known for your fitness, sir. People yeah. know you as being yeah. extreme. Yeah, I was always I was always pretty fit. I think it's just from being active all my life, like yeah. I've had a good endurance all my life, but um but now it's a different level. Yeah. <laughs> You've always been close with your mum as well, who sadly passed away. Was it 2014? Yeah, yeah it was, yeah. How was that for you? Because she was a massive supporter for you, always yeah. came to your fights. She didn't like your fights, of course, as any yeah. mother would, I'd, I'd yeah. imagine. But when she passed away, how difficult was that for you? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely broke me. Like, you know, it took a massive chunk out of me and it did take, well, it's still, it's still hard now. That's why I've got to keep busy. But it took a massive... Uh, massive thing out of the way and it was it was hard to deal with i didn't know how to deal with it it was you know me and my brother got through it together but it was um it was a very weird experience obviously i i didn't expect it was gonna i knew it was meant to have happened because she was ill for so many years but in my head i just kept i was like just visualizing there and nothing's gonna happen and then boom when it happened it just hit me like a ton of bricks and yeah it was hard but um i kind of just went back training straight away just trying to keep me focused but yeah it took took years and years to get her uh, yeah. get over that because that was a rare, a rare a rare disease that she had when all it the was, organs yeah. shut down yeah see that's difficult i've mentioned that a few times on the podcast my dad passed away with leukemia did it yeah and the body shuts down the kind of everything it's just it's sad to see that mm. you clearly obviously just fought through your pain but yeah i still don't know if i'm ever over you don't know if you've ever got over it how to get over nah grief or losing someone it's fucking so hard but yeah i think i think we just learn how to block it out yeah but we don't feel it anymore so when you're through that how long did it how long was that did that did your mum get told okay you're going to die or was it how yeah that... so she was ill for about five years what it, was the disease it was called uh, a langerhang disease it lch very rare lhc yeah it's very rare it's like it's mainly like um mainly like kids get it and stuff so it was more in kids and men more than women on their own so it was like one in a million or something mm -hmm. it's like you know there was probably one guy in the uk that really knew about it so pff, never heard of it i still never hear of it now you know what i mean so she had so many like problems going on for years and uh get going back and forth to hospital i can remember taking all the time and then uh all these different problems are happening but they just didn't know what it was they just kept going back and forth and then Eventually, there was like, right, yeah, she's got cancer. So it was like, oh, you know, that's awful. Like, was was trying to keep her strong, going through chemo for about a year. Um, yeah, she lost her hair, she had a wig. I've got a picture on my phone when she come to watch me fight, going through chemo. Uh, that was the last fight she went to, at, uh, Don local Doncaster Dome. And uh, there's, there's a picture, and it's it gets me all the time when I see it, because she's got a wig on next to my dad, and... She's just smiling away and it's like, it's the most powerfulest picture ever because mm -hmm. you can see in her eyes she's got a few tears and she she's not well at all and she's like, it's just a powerful picture because she's got that much emotion. Mm -hmm. 
but she's like so proud of me, like what I'm doing. It's oh, it was, it's horrible. Yeah, we'll use but, that picture. We'll put that picture at the start of this podcast. We'll dedicate this podcast to your mum. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you can send us a photo of them. You yeah. can put that at the start yeah, of this podcast. Be great. Yeah, definitely. Did you feel how difficult was it to how difficult is it for a fighter to fight after a tragic loss? Oh, it's horrendous. Because be people fair, yeah. look at fighters and think tough bastards. They yeah. don't feel any emotion or pain. But yeah. every fighter I've an, ever interviewed, they've got more emotion than anybody. Yeah, so definitely. how difficult was that for you to push through it? Very difficult. Um, like I said, I couldn't get my head around it for years. And, you know, I was, t I was just, I was literally taking fights on just a week notice just because I was wanting to get something just to fight, let a bit of anger out. But then I'd go into the fight angry. But because I had a... Uh, a year before my mum passed away, I was going back and forth with colitis. I had a disease, so um, I was struggling with that as well. Like obviously, I had anger, but then I want—I was ill as well, going into fights, and it was just—it was all pretty mad, really. But um, yeah, it's now I now I use it differently. I, I use it to fuel my training, fuel my fights, and now I, I look at it different than back then. But obviously, back then it was—you didn't know how to deal with it. Who knows how to deal with a loss? No one. Yeah. You just got to kind of just do it as it comes but yeah it's been very tough very tough yeah you just, in life mate you just kind of got to always kick on it's like people always like when it comes to Christmas season birthdays the day they die there's always something there that triggers that a smell and a, yeah. a song there's always something there that triggers it but for in life it, yeah. they always say you just got to keep swimming against the tide yeah. we're all in the same sea some people have got more waves crashing off them than others, but no. you've just got to keep fucking swimming. Yeah, definitely. So you've got, what was that disease there you mentioned? Uh, ulcerative colitis. So what was this you'd been battling with for eight years prior as well? Yeah, so probably about nine, ten years. About ten years I probably had it, and then I was basically having symptoms like cramping all the time, going to, rushing to the toilet 20 times a day, losing blood, fatigued. I was pale. I just didn't know what was going on for about a year. I kept going to the doctors and they kept saying it was IBS. And they just said, oh, change your diet. Um, and it just kept, didn't go away for about a year. And I was just getting to the point where it was just getting too bad. I, mean, I can remember my mum was in hospital at the time and she was messaging me while she was on her deathbed saying, let me know how you get on. Like she was struggling to message, but she kept ringing saying, oh, make sure you go to the doctor. So she was thinking of me while she was like dying, basically. That's how, what a woman she was. But yeah, I ended up going, my brother took me to A&E one day and was like, right, let's just go A&E because the doctors are not doing anything. They took some blood tests. I had some high information and they said, yeah, you need to see a specialist. So I waited another six months. So it just it, it got really bad quite quick. And um, I seen a specialist. He, uh, he had a camera and uh, the camera just showed ulcerative colitis and it was it was horrendous. Like a normal colon looks like rigid normal like color and this was like red raw there was no ridges and it was just you know when you get ulcers in your mouth mm -hmm. it was like full of them inside the colon and, and like when i looked at it it was like that's why i'm in pain like and losing blood because it was horrendous and it was severe colitis i got diagnosed with and obviously i knew it, i knew how bad of it how bad it was because obviously i felt the pain but i didn't really I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I didn't really like look it up and I was just on so many like strong treatments all the time. Going through, uh, I was on my first lot of treatments, some tablets. I had bad reaction a couple of months later and uh, they was treating me for a heart attack so I got rushed in and uh, I had information to the heart because I, I was allergic to the treatment. So I've been pretty bad. <laughs> I'm just... Uh, I've always been ill all my life. I've always had like illnesses. I'm just no. I just I'll just laugh it off now. But um, yeah, I've always been allergic to treatments all the time, and I never got on with any treatments. I was sat on like a chemo drip for twice. I was on it, and I was just having bad reactions to it. Basically, that's what it was like treatments, biological treatments. Nothing was working really. And then luckily, I went in for remission for about a year, and that was the prize fighting tournament year, 2019. The whole of that year, I was in my remission where it was under control, basically. Um, I moved to a different hospital. Um, and then, yeah, I was in remission for about a year and everything was under control. And then obviously the last year, last lockdown is when it just went bad again. So, yeah, it's it's been a mad mad journey. I, all my fight career, I've fought with colitis. Just dealt with it, really, and it's been hard. So how do you train through that then? 
Do you have down days? Do you, do you yeah. lie about your house and not do anything for two days? You seem like the kind of guy who's always constantly pushing yeah. to so, get out, yeah. to make something of their life. Yeah, I am um, basically always fatigued and always like ill like because it's an autoimmune disease it makes <clears> your whole immune system it affects your immune system and uh, when you go on these biological treatments they actually lower your immune system even more to battle the disease um, so I was always just ill basically always ill pale always had problems like rashes everywhere um, just from the treatments and stuff but I kind of just dealt with it like, every day I knew I knew I was going to have cramps, going to lose blood, rushing to the toilet. And I kind of just dealt with it and just, I always just put it in the back of my mind and like, right, I'm training. I used to always struggle getting up for training and stuff like that and work and stuff. And um, you're just constantly tired all the time. And, you know, because you, you go into the toilet that many times, um, it drains you, like physically drains you. And I don't know how I used to train and compete at the level I did and, going through colitis like when I look back now it's like I was really ill but you just get used to it and live with it like I, I just I used to think that was normal yeah it's mad I know my friend who from Mike's Beaconsfield to do we sponsored the show a few times my good friend Ollie um, battles with Crohn's disease as well yeah he's in the hospital all the time and they just constantly working pushing themselves to just you've got to keep being better they've got yeah. a teeth whitening company they've built it up from nothing to one of the <clears> biggest <throat> companies in Europe which is phenomenal but it's a mad disease. I think everybody struggles with it differently. So, how do you, how do you, how would your training do you think be if you never had that? Do you think being fit has kept you alive basically as well to help fight yeah. disease? It would make your immune system stronger, even yeah, though it gets yeah. weaker. But the white blood cells, I imagine, would be stronger to then fight these affections and disease. Like, how much has fitness helped you? Yeah, massively. I think having a good. Having a good, healthy, active lifestyle has definitely helped my colitis um, a little bit. But then I think when I over, used to overtrain a lot, it was a lot of inflammation inside the body, whereas colitis is inflammation in your colon. So the more inflammation I got, the worse it got. So, And also diet as well. Like When I used to cut weight for fights, I used to do extreme weight cutting, like cut 10 kilo to fight, and then you'd like go crazy and eat loads of food. And that used to mess my stomach up bad. Like salads and fruit used to mess your stomach up as well. Like you couldn't really eat salads. They mm. used to mess it up. So you couldn't really eat anything. It was it was hard. Like I didn't really know. Back then I was just eating what I wanted. And I think I didn't really, I should have like researched it more and took it more serious. But when you're young and you just want to, yeah. you know what I mean, just fight and go crazy. Do but you think that's a fighter's mentality? Fuck it. it I'll is, be yeah. fine. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Fighters, I'll be anything. Yeah, fighter's mentality is... And then it gets me killed. It's crazy. <laughs> it is mad. <laughs> what about going plant based or that? You see a lot of people going plant based and it kind of reverses things and changes things. Yeah. I've tried vegan, I've tried vegetarian, back eating meat again, but it's just different. Yeah. These different techniques. You, 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 people just don't know that I'm for everything, whatever your diet is. Do you know what? If it suits you and you're healthy, then yeah. by all means do it. Like, I know people, it's, my, my granddad lived to fucking 83 and he was smoking hash and there was eating pizzas and kebabs and they lived an okay life there's people out there dropping down dead and heart attacks fat yeah. as fuck 40 30 it's um you just don't know in life but it's trying to be as happy as you can be but for you to even train through all that through all that pain it just shows you what kind of character you're at yeah. it's phenomenal so when you won the world title against yeah. jimmy how was that feeling for you going through those? What, what did he get? Did the corner pull him out in the sixth round? Uh, no, it was the doctor. The doctor. Yeah, the, the cut was too big. It, it was it was squirting everywhere. Do you what know what I mean? That? It was a deep cut, and that must it, have been hard for him, though. Yeah, you could see it obviously in the video how frustrated he was. He didn't mm -hmm. want to. No one wants to like stop because mm -hmm. you know no one likes losing. And but when you get a, a cut like that, it can get dangerous, can't it? So you know, it comes first. Health comes first. You know, you don't want to die in the mm. bloody ring do you so and how was that feeling training hard for all those years to winning the world title at bare knuckle boxing what was that feeling and emotion like for you oh, it, was, it was unbelievable like, I'll never forget that moment you know when when they called the fight off it was just crazy and it was like everything I've worked for has come true and everything I've visualised has come true and it's happened like, I knew it was going to happen in my head there was not like when I went into that fight all I was thinking about was I'm not I'm there's no chance I'm losing this fight. So it was kind of more of a mental battle than anything, but mm. it was the best feeling ever. Honestly, it was crazy. 
Did your mum come into your head at that point? Hundred percent, yeah. Um, every before every fight, I'll uh, I've got some ashes next to my bed. And I'll do a little prayer or whatever. I'll go and see her in the cemetery, and uh, I always think about her before my fight. But I try not. I made a mistake one fight. Um, is in the prize fighter tournament, uh, the final. I put one of her funeral songs on. Just I don't know why I put it on, but it, it, it messed me up a little bit just before I walked out to the fight. My brother looked at me and he said after the fight, he was like, that, that messed you up, didn't it? I was like, yeah, I shouldn't have done it. And it just, I thought it was going to get me going a little bit, but it didn't. It made, it, made me worse. Yeah, but yeah. Make you slow down a bit. But like, luckily, I, I just kind of zoned out and went on it again. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, for the Jimmy fight, it just fueled me more than anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to win this for you. And when it when I won, I just I thought of my mum straight away. As soon as I won, my brother got me on his shoulders, and I just looked up and I was like, "That is for you." Do you know what I mean? Mm. It was amazing. I knew she should have been. She was with me then, hundred percent. For all looking, congratulations, brother. <laughs> and this was in two thousand and nineteen. Yeah, but straight after this fight, you nearly died because the disease you had ended up at his all time high. Was yeah. it the worst it'd ever been? Now you've got a, is it a lost in my bag? A lost in my bag, yeah. So now the, you, is it at the side you've got the bag where you, yeah. the toilet comes out? Yeah, it's just underneath yeah. the belly button. Um, mm -hmm. It's where this, this, it's called a stoma. The small intestines attached outside the, the stomach and and the, yeah, the toilet just goes straight into the bag and that's, that's about it really. They remove the whole large bowel so I've got no large bowel. I can't fart anymore. Can't, <laughs> can't go to the toilet anymore. Yeah. It's pretty mad, but I'm, I've got used to it quite quick. Yeah. Think of the money you're saving toilet paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, um, so when you fart that, does the bag ever move, or does it no? Is the bag going down? How does it work? Yeah, sometimes like only at night time it kind of blows up with a bit because when you lay on your back inside, it kind of like your bowels move, don't mm -hmm. they? And they're quite active. So, uh, yeah, it does let a like, bit of wind out your stomach sometimes. It frightens me. <laughs> and how was that then for a man to be going through that? Is, for the eight years, the pain, the, everything you were going through, has it helped you get in the bag then? Is there 100%. no more pain as much? Yeah, it's, it's weird not, not having pain every day. Like, it's weird not having these cramps. I feel like I'm normal again. Hmm. And it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not every day, I'm not fatigued and I'm not like, ill and i'm not struggling every day now i feel brand new so i wish i got this like five years ago could you have um was it awful to you no because it wanted it wanted at that stage where it was uh because uh, they say surgery is last resort and i was avoiding it for years mm -hmm. but they did say it five years ago that um there was like you know if a couple of these more treatments don't work you're gonna have to have surgery and i was just like no i'm not having that 100 percent in my head i was like i'm not having surgery I think because I had avoided it for that many years, it just got just kept getting worse. Was it the bag it put you off? Yeah, it was the bag, and obviously my fighting career. I thought that was going to be it; it was over. And uh, when they said I had to have it last lockdown, I didn't have a choice. You know, I, I thought that was it; my fighting career is over, my life's over. But obviously, it wasn't. I, it was just what goes through your head at the time. You kind of because I don't. People don't really. Um, there's not really much about it. There is, obviously, it's massive, but people are embarrassed and insecure about it. Um, you know, having having this alostomy bag, but I didn't really know many people with it. Luckily, one of my friends had one, um, and he, he opened up to me and come, come and talked to me about it, and he made me feel better just before I went for surgery. But other than that, I didn't really have much info on it. I didn't really know anything about it, and it was a scary time, you know what I mean? You are only 26 at that time, 27? Yeah, 20... Yeah, 20... 2019 then? Just turned 27, I think. So how was that to accept that then, to get that done? Were you Did you have a depression after that? I was pretty bad for a couple of months because it, um, it started in June in the lockdown because it was in the middle of lockdown. I was doing a lot of endurance work. Well, I was basically just at home. We couldn't go anywhere. So I was, I was just training like a madman. And I, every day I was just doing like long endurance. I did half an Ironman. I was doing 100k bike rides and all that information built up. So I don't know whether it sped it up a little bit, but I'm glad it happened in lockdown because obviously nothing's happening. But um, it, it got to a stage where things started opening up with lockdown and I couldn't go out the house for about two, three months. I was stuck in the house, couldn't go anywhere. Me and my missus, we, uh, we planned to go for a night away, just one, just to get away, get out the house. And 
it, I, I ruined the, the, the day away because I was just rushing to the toilet. I was in, I was in agony. It must have been 50 times. And I got rushed. The day after we had the night away, I got rushed into hospital again. I got admitted. I must have been in hospital 10 times for about two weeks at a time. So I spent eight weeks in hospital. And they kept putting me on different treatments and they kept saying, you need surgery. And I said, no, I'm not having surgery. I kept avoiding it. And obviously it got to the stage where I had, I had a camera up the back passage and they said, it's either going to turn into cancer or it's going to rupture inside and you'll probably die. So I was like, just give me one more week. Like, I just want another week. And I, I was just... I was in a bad place, really bad place. You know, when you're drugged up in hospital as well, everything just rushes through your head and you get mixed thoughts. You know, you're, you're thinking, my life's over, my career's over. I, I, was, I was even thinking, what if my missus finishes me? Like, uh, that's a crazy idea because she never would. She's amazing, best support I've ever had. But, you know, you get crazy thoughts because you're just spaced out on drugs and stuff. But I was doing loads of research on uh, nutrition and I come across a guy, Mark Heidman, I think he was called in America, some expert. And I started researching. I went, it was basically a vegan diet, I think it was. It was a meat and vegan diet, both in one. But it was like a... I started doing loads of research. and So I started going like... Um, I got loads of food in. So I was out of hospital for a week. And I, was, I tried this diet. But over, t I must have lost about 12 kg as well. I was, I was so ill at the time. Um, I've got a picture on my phone from when it was like one 12 kg difference. It was crazy. But I tried this diet for a week and lost loads of weight. I, f I was cooking every day, but I just got ill again. End of the week, and then I got rushed in again, and that was it. That was the last time I thought, yeah, this is it. I've, I ain't got a choice now. Mm -hmm. And then I got rushed in it in the middle of the night and uh, the, the basically it was like three in the morning drugged up and all these surgeons rushing in waking me up like you know you need surgery now I'm like this is like a it was like off a movie it was scary do you know what I mean like it was in a, I was in a bad place really and no one could visit you because it was the middle of COVID mm -hmm. no one can come and visit me in hostel my missus she's there like worrying me my brother's there worrying you know what I mean it was it was bad time for everyone in my family my miss yeah my missus she she thought I was gonna die. Like she actually told her mum, she's like, I think he's gonna die. Like what? She, she that's how bad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She's she's trying to work as well full time, but she had to have like a week off and stuff because it was bad. And it was yeah, it was a horrendous time. But um, I had to accept I was gonna have surgery, and uh, that was it. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And I had to decide. It took me a week in hospital just to decide. You know what I mean? Like phone calls to my partner, to to Danny Mitchell, my coach, my brother, John Watton, my other coach, and was just trying to get some positive positivity back and doing some research. Danny got back to me and said, Look, there's a fighter who's got a bag, like a boxer. He come across this guy in America who he's seen. And that gave me a bit of hope. And uh, I thought, Do you know what? I ain't got a choice, but I can't just sit and cry about it. I've just got to get it done. And, uh, they wanted it done there and then, but I said, look, just give me two weeks. Let me go home on some strong steroid tablets and uh, let me have two weeks to let it sink in. And then, uh, yeah, they booked me in. Three, late, three weeks later, it was uh, they booked me in for the surgery. And I was, I was kind of in a good place when I went in because I accepted it by then. And, How uh, long was the operation? It was eight hours, eight hour keel surgery. So it was a, it was a major surgery and it was, it was a long one. I've never, I've only had one little surgery on my nose before. And that was it. I'd never had anything like that before, and it, it was it was it was like I was preparing for a fight going into that surgery. It was mad. It was pretty crazy. What was that like the first time you woke up with the bag on? Was it weird, strange? Yeah, I kind of I can remember waking up in intensive care and looking around. And I was just spaced out on bloody morphine. And <laughs> there was on morphine and ketamine. I was on. It was, That's the good yeah. stuff there. I was tranquilized. <laughs> so I was just like spaced out thinking, right. yeah, this is this is bad. And then I fell back to sleep and then I woke up in my room. Um, I was in a room on my own, woke up. And then this, this woman come in, this nurse, and I looked down at the bag in the first time and it was just, I was like mortified. I was like, shit, this is crazy. But it, it was just because it was one of the medical bags. It was see-through, so you could see everything in there. And it was, you could see the stoma, 
and it was like all green acid coming out at first um and it was it was a massive shocker but because uh, i was in a bit of pain and everything was just going like really fast um i was out in four days four days and i was out because i was just recovered quick and i managed to change the bag so i was out in four days and uh it was just it was just crazy really it was a mad experience but you're still here to tell the tales you know what i mean exactly. that's all part of your journey that's all part of the story yeah. this is what <laughs> people buy into the inspiration the motivation not to quit to keep going end of the day it's a fucking bag you've got to do the toilet somewhere yeah exactly you just do it in a fucking bag a bit yeah you know what i mean how's other people treat you like other fighters and that is it okay when you've got it on? How do you fight? Do you put something around that, or does yeah, it freak yeah. other people out? Yeah, I, I, when I went the first time, people's like properly looked is when I went swimming first time. Like if people are going to look. I would look. <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah, want yeah, yeah. to look. I know. But we're all nosy bastards. Do you know what I mean? So as I, mean, a guy, I go to swimming as a guy who swims with one leg and he takes. Really? And I always look and I think, yeah. stop fucking. Yeah, you it's feel just bad, one of them things, it? You're just a nosy bastard. Yeah. To be honest, I, I know people are going to look because it's yeah. natural. It's like, you know, it's not normal. Some, someone actually, some old bloke said to me last weekend, he was like, is that a, is that a tracker? <laughs> is, that, is that some sort of tracker for your lamps? And I, I was like, yeah, because I was using my Garmin watch. I was like, yeah, it's, uh, it tracks my lamps. He was like, what, that thing on your stomach? I was like, oh no, that's a shit bag, mate. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was like, no, no, you're all right. You know, because people's not used to seeing it. I've, yeah. ne I've never seen anyone with it. And, you know, I, I get a few stares, but I, I don't mind showing it off. I don't yeah. mind, you know, I, I tell people about it and I just like raising the awareness for it. Yeah, you've just got to own it. Yeah, definitely. Fuck's sake, it's a bag in the stomach. It's, yeah. It's fuck all. It's just, you just got to own it. So now then, going through all that, the emotion, the ups and the downs, the pushing through, thinking your girlfriend's going to leave, you think you're going to die, thinking your fight career's cut yeah. over. It's not just one thing, you're thinking, a fighter's coming to end his career and he's thinking, okay, I'm going to retire. Yeah. You've got everything. How am yeah. I going to make an income? Am I going to lose my partner? Yeah. Am I going to live or die? There's it's so much. So you've got all that pressure in That's what one. I mean, yeah. So how have you managed to handle that? Especially in lockdown, has that helped though with nobody about? And kind yeah, of I think it's helped because obviously in my head, I know nothing's going on, no fight shows. So I'm, I'm so kind of not, not missing out on I'm, anything. I feel like I won't missing out on yeah. much. So it happened in a good time and I recovered. I recovered really fast. And I, I think, yeah, definitely I'm glad it happened during lockdown. Yeah. So how did you handle it all then? Uh, yeah. everything hitting you at once did you start how long did it take you to start back training also after the the main surgery um after the first eight hour surgery i kept having loads of severe complications just because it's me i've always got complications but mm -hmm. i started having bad blockages and um two weeks later i was back in hospital and uh, i got rushed in by an ambulance my missus thought i was dying again I'm like, <laughs> For fuck's i was like is, this is never ending uh. And uh, it just seemed never ending. I was like, this is, I was getting bad cramps again. And I thought, what's going on here? And then I got rushed in. I was in, I was in for a week and they were sticking tubes down my stoma while I was awake. And it was horrendous. The pain was crazy. And um, I thought, you know, why, why am I going to have blockages all my life now? Is this going to be it? Like just back and forth in hospital. And I was, I was badly again. I thought that was it after the first, but then I was getting mentally bad again. I was, it was struggling. And then a week later, I got rushed in again. I had to have emergency surgery because um, there was a stitch internally too tight, a little bit too tight, and it was causing, causing some severe blockages. So I was getting blocked up. Nothing was coming out. And um, this, I was getting severely sick. And uh, they basically said, if it's not going to come out that way, it's going to come out this way. And I was going to be sick. Like, And there was going to be crap. Shut out yeah, basically shitting out your mouth. And that was a mad thought. And... Uh, so they had to do emergency surgery, but they had to stick tubes down my throat to get like acid out. Oh, it was horrendous. And uh, that was that was the worst time, worse than the first surgery, because I had this emergency surgery. I rushed, it was like, right, you can you have surgery tomorrow? And I was like, what? Why do I need surgery? I thought you unblocked it. It was like, yeah, you, there's a stitch too tight. We just need to refashion the stoma. So I was like, yeah, whatever, let's go. I didn't have time to think. It was the next day. I got into the theater, and uh, I had to have another epidural in my back and it wouldn't go in. I was like, and it got it in and it was, it was killing. And then I thought, right, let's just put me to sleep and let's get going. And then he was like, oh no, because of COVID, you've got to stay awake. I'm like, you I was like, what? 
I've got to stay awake during this surgery. You're going to be <gasps> ramming into me. So that was like a mad... As soon as he said it, I had about 10 minutes to get prepared. Mate. I'm glad he told me then because I, w I would have probably jumped out. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about fucking it off. I was like, I'm not staying awake during this. I've been through enough shit. But then... Uh, literally. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. And he put this, um, he, he put me sedated. So I was, I was just like half drowsed, half knocked out. And they put a big sheet here so I couldn't see. And people were talking to me, but... Yeah, I was awake for surgery for a few hours, but you could feel them prodding and stuff. But when I come out, because I didn't have no food for about five days, my stomach was empty. I was on strong morphines. I was on oral morphines and I was on tramadols, all sorts of tablets going through. Because it was a tablet form, it was affecting my stomach and I had severe sickness for about three days. Um, but then I couldn't be sick because my stomach was that tender from the surgeries. I was, I was straining my stomach every time I was trying to like be sick, and uh, I actually thought that that Saturday I thought I'm, I thought I was dying again. I thought that was it. This is the worst I've ever felt in my life. I never forget that day, that full day of being sick, and it was just green acid coming out, and it was the worst feeling. I'd rather have cramps in my stomach than that. Mm -hmm. And they had to stick tubes down my throat again, and oh, it was horrendous. There's that many. I've got horrible pictures on my phone just for like you know keeping memories mm -hmm. but whenever i get a feeling of being sick again it gives me flashbacks but that was the worst day but after that touch wood everything got back to normal mm -hmm. and i've never had a problem since never had a blockage never had any pains i've got on really well with the bags but yeah i think the main thing that got me through it was um just surrounding me with good people good positive people i've, I've got um john Wattam. he's the uh, He's like a mind coach. He does triathlons, Ironmans. Really positive guy. So he gets me in a good place. Danny Mitchell's really positive. He's my coach. My brother, my partner. You know, they're just all feeding me positives. So, you know, just uh, trying to think positive as well. Like thinking, what would my mum do? What would she be saying right now? And you know what I mean? Just trying to get through. But in my head, I was like, oh, I've lost my mum. This has happened now. I was like, there's no hope. It's just going to keep getting worse all the time. Mm. I'm not going to be able to fight again. So I was getting all these thoughts going through my mind. And I'll be honest, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be here. After the surgery, I was having thoughts because my missus was back to work and I was stuck in the house 24-7. I, I couldn't even go out for a walk, couldn't go downstairs. I was laid in bed for about four, well, three weeks, I think. And, you you know, you get mad thoughts and you're, you're like, I don't want to be here anymore. Suicidal? It was, yeah. I, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was getting them thoughts, and my partner was really strong. You know, she, because I used, um, I struggled a bit, obviously, when my mum went before, but she's always been there, and my brother's always been there as well. But it was just hard because I was always on my own. But luckily, touch wood, I had my two dogs, and they kept me going through the whole of it. I, I, honestly, they are, they are the cure for a lot of things. Mm. Dogs are honestly, they're amazing, and. Uh, you know, that's that bit of company and they're always there with you. But I think, yeah, after after I get out walking about again, I think that was it. My mindset was focused on uh, just getting things put in place like triathlons and fighting again. Because one thing like John Motten and Danny were saying, especially John, he was saying, look, what you got to do while you're laid in bed resting, like you, you're not be able to do it. Try not to think about the, your stomach and what's going on. Try and think about what what you're going to do in the future and think like set some targets, set some goals. So he actually, uh, I went and seen him a month later and he booked me in for a triathlon in September this year. And he was like, I'll book you in for this, give you something to motivate you for, something to work towards, keep your mind focused, even though you're not going to be training just yet. Um, and all I, all I was thinking about was Jimmy Sweeney again. I was like, right, I'm going to get back and I'm going to rematch Jimmy like next year. Even though there was like, I wasn't even expecting to fight this year at all. I was thinking about a couple of years, but my recovery was that quick. I was training, I was back in the bag in about a month. Um, a month after surgery, or two weeks, I think, after the second surgery, I was out in the garden knitting the bag and I kept ripping ripping the stitching out on the on the on this where the surgery was so I didn't listen I was I just used to rush back and overdo it again but luckily uh settled down I, I managed to get listened to me 
my family and they're like, look, just let it heal first and then you can train. So I slowed it down, started doing a bit of biking, a bit of running slowly and I built it up. I built it up from the beginning again, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, after about two months, the muscle memory started kicking in and my fitness started coming back slowly and that was it. There's no more pains. Yeah. It was crazy. I feel and like a new man. It was like, yeah, it was like I was... Terminators come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How was it then? What weight were you starting to train again when you lost everything? Did you lose over 28 pounds, 30 pounds? Yeah, so I normally sit around 80 kg. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can remember I got to about 69 before the surgery and I tried to bulk up a little bit again and then it was hard. I was trying to eat loads of carbs. But then after the surgery, um, I was down to about 72 and I started eating more. Obviously, you couldn't really eat. You had to eat certain things for like two months. Can you like, still eat the same with the <laughs> operation and stuff? Can you still eat normal? Yeah. Then? Yeah, yeah. I can still eat. I can eat anything I want now, basically. Mm-hmm. I can eat more. I can eat stuff that I wasn't eating when I had colitis. Normal. How does that affect your, how did that affect your fitness? Like, can you still run as far? Can you still go as many rounds? Can you still push yourself to the extreme with the bag? With the bag, does yeah. Does that affect anything? Liver, no. kidneys, breathing? No, so I, I, I honestly thought, you know, I wouldn't be able to do like I did, but I was doing, I'm doing everything I was before, but doing it better. Mm-hmm. Like, do you know, when I had, uh, when I had colitis, I couldn't, I couldn't go any further than 5k run. Um, when I was having a bad flare up, only when I was in remission, I could do like long endurance, but throughout the whole fight camps, so it's probably 5k and then I'd, my stomach would cramp. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to, run back home like I couldn't I couldn't go far you know what I mean so it's it's always been a struggle but now I can do anything without wor- worrying mm. there's no worries yeah so how do you fight then how do you get into a bare knuckle fight obviously you've got you can't go down a certain level in the waist but yeah. what happens if somebody punches it or kicks it in an MMA fight yeah what, can it so, rupture um, or anything can it break yeah one f- one main thing is getting hernias uh, around the stoma because it's obviously when they're when they're stuck into it ripped open your muscle into your abs it's weak and the, they say hernia is one of the most things so i've got a, i forgot a few support belts and stuff but basically when i'm boxing i've got a, the boxing guard actually comes above the mm-hmm. uh the stoma um and you can get some support belts as well but i can i can like tap it myself and it doesn't hurt but i've not actually took a full-on punch to it yet but i think with the boxing guard over the top and uh, another support belt and stuff i'm pretty confident i've done some sparring I've took a few steady shots on it, and it don't even when I'm sparring, it, I don't even cross my mind it's there anymore. You know, every day I don't even I don't even I forget it's there sometimes. Yeah, it'll just become the norm. Just like yeah. brushing your teeth, it just becomes exactly. the norm. But yeah. for a fighter, especially going with Jimmy, I'd imagine he would aim for that. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Nobody's going to fuck about. It's a, it's a. You're in that ruthless yeah. sport where yeah. it's killer be kill. So people are going to go for your vulnerabilities. But yeah, no doubt if your mindset, you're able to work around that. Definitely. So how are you feeling then when the rematch get called with Jimmy Sweeney after going <coughs> through all your pain, your fucking suicidal thoughts, yeah. you're thinking you're going to lose everything, thinking your life was over, to then getting a rematch, fighting fit again. How was that feeling for you? Best feeling ever. When I when I confirmed that fight. It was like, it was the best feeling ever. Do you know, just to get back in that ring is going to be a massive achievement. Never mind when I win it, when I beat him again. It's just going to be a massive achievement just getting back in again. And for me, that's that's the main thing. Just getting in that ring and within a lost me bag and what I've been through is, is going to be a, a great relief. And I'll just be so happy to get in. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it was a good feeling knowing I can f- compete again. Mm-hmm. It was that, I think that was one of the main things that helped me get through recovery was knowing I'll be able to box again. Just always having that on the back of my mind, like I will box again and I will prove everyone I will, you know, prove surgeons wrong and stuff like that. So Did they tell you not to fight? Um, yeah. What, so before surgery and stuff, I was, I was asking them so many questions like, you know, I want it as low as possible because I'm going to box again. They was, they're looking at me gone out like, you sh- yeah, yeah. They just like kept saying, yeah, yeah. all right. And uh, I was like, you know, is there anyone ever boxed with this before? And I was like, they're not, no, they've, they've not known anyone. Do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it was kind of all, they just probably thought I was just mad and they probably thought I... Right, they were right though. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just from my mindset, I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to fight again and that's it, end of. And I will find a way to fight again. And... The only one uh, I might struggle with is mixed martial MMA again because obviously there's kicks, there's grappling, 
I'm actually, I'll have to find a way to get a support guard just to cover it and what promotions will let me fight on there. Mm-hmm. But my coach, Danny Mitchell, is keen. And he's pretty positive will get me on an MMA fight as well. Yeah. Anything can be done, man. Anything can be got. Like, this is all part of your journey, the inspiration to help people, the motivation to never quit. And yeah. That's what it's all about. Never give up. Never let what doctors fucking say consume you and think, yeah. okay, I'm just going to take their advice. Yes, take your advice from some things, but it's still your life yeah. to live it. Do you want to lie in your house and your bed all day just feeling sorry for yourself, yeah. crying into your fucking pillow thinking, that's it, because yeah. that ain't living. You know that yourself. Exactly. I've had many inspirational people on here, but your stories, I actually love your story. You're a fucking right good guy, yeah. man. Like, for what you're coming through and what you're pushing towards, and you're still young, to have that yeah. mindset at a young age. Were you doing any reading or any motiv- listening to any motivational videos? Were you? Yeah, I was watching to- your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was watching a lot of uh, yeah. I was watching a lot of Gordon Ramsay as well, mm. mad, weird, weirdly. <laughs> just watching a lot of Maybe food he's got a thing for the Scottish people, mate. I know, yeah, and uh, yeah, I was I was reading some books, podcasts, and uh, David Goggins. I was watching. I was just reading like loads of positivity mm. stuff, and um, yeah, just getting them positive thoughts, and you're hanging around with positive people, just gets you through. And any any negative thoughts and that just brings you down all the time. So yeah, it's it's one of the main things. That gets you through, to be fair. Yeah. So your fight, when is your fight? Um, it's 14th of August. And uh, is it the O2? We're going to have a crowd done again then, yeah. London? Yeah, there's a full crowd again, they say. So. How many people's in there <coughs> watching? I think uh, two and a half to three thousand in the London mm-hmm. Indigo. It's, mm-hmm. So it's inside the O2 at the Indigo. It's a nice, nice big uh, theatre place. It's, yeah, it's good. How come? Yeah, well, is it sold out yet? Is the tickets been out? Uh, tickets, there should be out soon. There'll yeah, be a I'll link. Get a couple but, of um, tickets, man. I'll yeah, definitely I'll be def- there to I'll support s- you, mate. Yeah, um, that'll, be, that'll be good. So how's the training going to be for this fight then? Um, to be fair, I'm fitter than I was already on the last fight. Mm-hmm. 100%. I can't believe like the fitness um, is improved. So I think, do you know, just because I'm not fatigued and tired all the time, but uh, I've I've basically started doing a lot of triathlon training. So I've got actually three triathlons coming up in the next month or so. So I'm looking forward to just competing in them as well, keeping me fit. But since I've been on a proper training plan, um, it's actually Doc John's coach, uh, Dean Kirkman. He's He does world championship level mm-hmm. uh, Ironman. So he's so clever. He knows what he's doing. So he's, he's done me a pro triathlon plan. I've been on it for about 10 weeks and... Training smarter with that. I've never really had a proper plan. I've always like overtrained because that's just that old school style where you just every session you go full on. But now I'm training smarter. I've got a set plan what I'm doing. So I'm getting them recovery days in properly. Training every day, do you know what I mean? No, no days yeah. off. But because of me training smarter, I'm getting so fitter quick. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I start me camping about four or five weeks. Mm-hmm. I'll have a solid eight week camp, get some solid uh, sparring in. So I'm just looking forward to starting, just starting to get in camp again. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Something to look forward to. Definitely, yeah. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> feeling fitter, feeling stronger. What weight is it? Super middleweight? Are you middleweight? Um, yeah. So the bare knuckle, uh, the weights are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I think mine's like featherweight title, even though it's yeah. at 75 kg mm-hmm. on the same day. Um, it's same day weighing as well. So you've got to get down. There's no big mm-hmm. weight cuts. Because obviously dehydrate yourself for a bare knuckle mm. fight is a bit dangerous. So try and get down. I think it's lightweight or featherweight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's uh But when you hit the weights, people's targets are some people are a kilo yeah. over and under. How is that in the weight division? Is it not as close as it has to be? <clears throat> um, yeah. So obviously, if you're a few pounds over, you've got to try and cut the weight. Yeah. So saunas or anything mm-hmm. like that, just trying to burn the weight off. But You've got to be pretty much bang on, yeah, bang on weight. Yeah. So, do you think obviously you win this fight then? Get well, into it. Hundred percent. He's getting stopped within five rounds. Have you spoke to him yet? Uh, yeah, he's, I've spoke to him uh, after surgery. He's, he's always been quite respectful, and he messaged me saying sorry to hear about you know going through mm-hmm. surgery and stuff like that. And um, yeah, we, we've messaged each other now and again, just being respectful. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got that respect for each other, like fighters, but. End of the day, this is a fight and he's in my way in my dream. So uh-huh. Did you still got the belt? Yeah, I've still got the belt, yeah. Uh-huh. Um it's in me it's in my room where mm. just in case case you weren't active, they maybe took it off yeah, and had no, to no, us... I'm still I'm still the champ, so mm-hmm. I'll be defending the belt August. And he'll uh, be buzzing for it as well. Yeah. 
So he will. Yeah, so he's only had one loss mm -hmm. um, against Julian Lane's ex UFC fight, and he revenged mm -hmm. the loss. So he's never he's never lost twice to the same person. But is he a gypsy? Big gypsy. Big, yeah, he's uh, an Irish gypsy. Yeah, both, Jimmy. Yeah, the tough bastards. Those so gypsies, are, man. It's like, in the blood, isn't it? It's yeah, in the love fighting. Irish travellers. Yeah. It's in the blood. Uh, you know, bare knuckle boxing. It. It's in the bloodline, and they've done it for decades. Yeah, you've got two dogs, two rescue dogs. Yes, I have. Yeah, pride and joy. How is that being? Father to two dogs. Oh, it's amazing, mate. Better than kids. <laughs> <laughs> because I know you've spoken about having a third dog, fourth dog. You want a house oh, with yeah. 10 dogs, you've said. Yeah. Um, dogs are the best. Why do you love the dogs so much? And why rescue dogs? Which is a phenomenal thing. I respect yeah. that as well. Um, I've always wanted a dog since when I was young, but my dad would never let me have one. I don't know. What, it's just I never really had a dog, but I've always wanted a dog. And then when me, me, me and my partner, um, we bought a house, I was like, yeah, I want a dog. We need a dog. Just to... And obviously when my mum passed away, it was kind of like a, um, what do you call it, a grieving kind of thing. Someone was like, you know, maybe get a dog. And it was the best thing I did for grieving was to get a dog. And uh, I actually called him after me, Bonbon. It was mm -hmm. after the sweet fight, Bonbon. I, I used to eat a lot of bonbons back in the day, so mm -hmm. that's why they call me it. But um, when I got when I got me, me, my first dog, that I was, it, it just, I fell in love with him straight away. And it was... Man's best friend, aren't they? You know what yeah. I mean? That connection you have with a dog and the bonding you have is unreal. The loyalty every time you come in. There's, oh, dogs are amazing. I'm, I'm obsessed. Yeah. And uh, I just love taking them out in the in the, in the the wildlife and, you know what I mean? Just catching a few rabbits. But yeah, yeah I think the, the one rescuing dogs as well, is just get, I get a buzz out of rescuing because you see them in that kennel, you see the little face and Dog being broken. abused. Yeah. yeah. I think my first one, Bon, was abused quite bad because he, he was like really scared. He was underweight. He was he always used to be scared when you go to tap him and stroke him. So just now he's got the life of luxury. He's, the amount he's come out is unreal. Like he was never, he used to be so scared all the time, but now he just, he's like the man now. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I rescued me another one about two years ago. She was a working dog. So she's a killer in, like, inside her. But she's like the most lovingest dog ever. You know what I mean? So everywhere I go, she just follows me. And mm. it's it's a nice feeling. Do you know what I mean? When <laughs> two dogs. Yeah, dogs are the next level. I'd have that? about 20. Yeah, it's the loyalty and it's the companionship. Like they don't speak back. There's no negativity. And as soon as dog sees you, they're just happy. But yeah. that's what I'm hoping. Get the bigger house and then get two or three dogs. It's, um, Definitely. It's fucking hard work though. It is, but yeah. <laughs> it's worth it because they, what, they give back. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 100%. The happiness and... That's what's probably kept you alive as well. <laughs> We've got the missus and the brother and the yeah. fight. And it's, you kind of want to, like, they, they do say that like, people with, in their 50s and 60s, when if they've got a dog, they live longer. Yeah. Because. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. They need to be there for their I dog. I reckon it's good for your mental health as well, getting a dog. It's, you know, they just keep you company. Mm -hmm. and especially if you live on your own or, or like that, I suggest, I recommend getting a dog. Or if you've just, you know, if you've lost someone in your family close or, it's good for like that grieving, yeah. you know, it keeps you busy, keeps you focused and it's just someone there. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. And you know what I mean? I, I like dogs better than humans as well. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So Same. they are amazing. Going forward for the future, brother. Yep. What's the plans? Uh, I've got a triathlon next week mm -hmm. and then the week after. Uh, keep, that's just going to keep me busy in shape. And then obviously the Jimmy fight in August, get that, get that dealt with. Um, and yeah just get back in the ring that'll be amazing and then just go from there really mm -hmm. my plan is just to travel the world fighting getting paid for fighting traveling the world as well and just keep raising the awareness for elostromy and helping people out i've helped quite a lot of people out since coming out of it and posting it on me social media because i've got a bit of a platform to work from mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of people being messaged me so i've helped a lot of people out which is a good feeling as well um because a lot of people do struggle with it People feel alone. Yeah, alone. Yeah, embarrassed, alone, confused. So, helping the people out with colitis, elostomy. A lot of people are just getting ready for surgery and they're scared. And the the message of me and I've I'm out to mart a lot going through the surgery. So, that's that's pretty mad. Seeing as I've only had it for about six months, it's pretty crazy. But, um, yeah, just to keep fighting, have a nice family, and just just live the dream and just enjoy life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just travel the world. Just look each day, just enjoy it. I think that's the main thing. Just be happy. 
Um, you know what I mean? So it's not about having money all the time. I, think, I just think it's just whatever you do in life, you've just got to enjoy it and just be yeah. happy and enjoy what you do every day. And I, I'm loving it. I'm loving yeah, life. It's good. That's the main thing. What it about is. trying to go to America? I know America's <clears throat> big for this kind of stuff, bare knuckle yeah. fighting. How do you get into America? Was you, Is that something on your hit list? Uh, yeah, I'd love to fight some, Amer even if to get some big names from America and coming over here to fight as well. I'd love to go and fight in America. I'd love to go and f I fought in Thailand before. I fought in Russia. I fought all over the world as well, but just to fight in America would be good. I've always wanted to fight in America and uh, Japan or somewhere crazy like that. Yeah, I just, yeah I'd love to. It's, it's just a nice experience. Getting paid to track, get fighting mm -hmm. abroad is... Who's the big names in America at your weight class? Um, in Bare Knuckle, there's a guy, Artem Loboff, McGregor's for, uh, mate, Irish guy. He... Um, He's had a few big fights and he's got a massive platform. Um, he's quite big in the game at the minute with Jason Knight. So there's a few Americans out there. Um, I'd fight any of them. <laughs> all at once, fuck it. I'd fight them next weekend yeah. if I wanted it. But um, yeah, there's some big names. Like X, they're all like ex-UFC mm -hmm. fighters and stuff like that. So they're big names. That's what I want next. I want big names coming in. Ex-UFC fighters, Bellator fighters, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. But, but everything you've set your sights on, everything you've visualised yeah. has came true. So this is just another step. Yeah, 100%. Um, win your next fight in August, and then whatever, maybe another fight at the end of the year, and then possibly America next year. Yeah. It's, um, it will happen. You, you're clearly that guy who believes what he sets out to do. What about um, for anybody that's in the struggle, brother? For anybody that's maybe going through a big operation, not <clears> necessarily <throat> what you went through, but... yeah. For a man of yourself who's been in the ring and fights bare knuckle, to then lie in his hospital bed scared, that yeah. shows that you are yeah, human. Everybody's exactly. human. Yeah. We all have those feelings and emotion. But for anybody that's maybe going for a big operation or struggling to maybe go and <clears> see a doctor about something, what yeah. advice would you give for them? Yeah, obviously everyone goes through them hard times. Everyone has down days. and But you just got to think, you know, there's always light at that end, the end of that tunnel, whatever you're going through. So it's just even though it's hard you're going to have down days and down weeks but there's always it's always going to be it's going to get better you know what I mean so there's always a bit of hope and just keep setting them targets and goals all the time if you're feeling like shit that's what I try and uh, I actually set up a whatsapp group to help people of getting back to the gym training bit of mental health as well and you know I always say on there just set goals and targets all the time even like even just daily goals just to keep your mind busy and uh, if you've got nothing to work for, you're going to, I think it's, you, people do struggle to find motivation and stuff. So I think that's what keeps me going is setting targets, goals, like these small ones every day. And then obviously fights, triathlons, they're the bigger ones. But yeah, there's uh, just keep going strong because there's always hope. There's yeah. always hope there. And uh, I always think this one thing that gets me through is someone's always got it worse than you. So I always think, you know, I've got a, I've got my bowels removed. I've got a bag, but someone's got no arms, no legs. Yeah. Someone's gonna die. You know what I mean? So, you, you, there are positives yeah. in every situation. Exactly. We'll give a shout out to Big Georgia King as well. I know yeah, who I had George. him on. <laughs> big Daredevil, also extreme athlete. How do you know George? Big George. Yeah, uh, we started following each other on Instagram, and uh, I can remember him from years ago when he climbed the shard, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Who's this crazy man climbing up there with no ropes?" And then he got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> that was just crazy, yeah, wasn't it? And then yeah. he, he, that's uh, that's how he got big. And he's on mm. Channel Four. He's on this morning. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just that you know it's mindset again, isn't yeah. it? It's crazy. Believe in yourself. But, yeah. Um, listen, brother, it's been an inspiration to have you on the day. I think it's phenomenal what you're achieving and what you're going to do for the future. Definitely. But for coming on today and telling your story, I yeah, very much thank appreciate you. it. And looking forward to your next fight. It's been a pleasure coming Cheers, on, brother. mate. Thank you. God bless you. Cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.